Well, we are in our series called Welcome to the Neighborhood, and this, is, this series really is kind of a continuation of our, of our last series. I really believe that God has intentionally slowed us down, like He has put us in the neighborhood. Like uh, today, we are at the Darnells and sitting in their living room. I, I never... <laughs> You could have never told me this six months ago that, I, that I'd be sitting in your living room and we'd be doing church. It reminds me of the early days when, when, we, when we first started. Some of you don't even know this journey. When we first started, we started in a home. That was how we had our first meeting. And then we went to a school and then we eventually ended up in the facility that we're, we're in now. So uh, that's how we're going to roll back in. We're, we're, <laughs> no, well, no, no, we're not. Uh, But this series that we're doing, Welcome to the Neighborhood, is we are intentionally in the neighborhoods because I I believe that God wants to speak to us while we are in these neighborhoods. I I believe there's a reason why that we are not gathering together in our large group gathering right now. But it's going to require all of us to just stop and really think about what God's trying to do. Think about personally, what is God trying to say to me? And, and, and what is it God is wanting to do collectively in, in all of us? Because I, I believe he wants to speak to all of us. And I think this is also an opportunity for us. We're only going to be doing this a few more weeks, and then we're going to be opening up uh, the facility. Uh, you know, God willing, we'll be able to open up the facility here in a few weeks. But um, we are also doing this. I think this is an opportunity for us to get stronger. I think for us as, as a church, it's an opportunity as we gather in homes, or, or maybe you're on Zoom, or maybe you're just with your family today. It's, it's an opportunity for you to grow stronger with your family. It's an opportunity to us to grow stronger individually in our relationship with Jesus and come back even stronger. Like, I don't want any of us to think, first of all, that somehow God has created the racial unrest. He's created the um, COVID-19. He's responsible for all that. No, no, no. God is not responsible for the bad things that are happening in our world, but God always wants to bring something good out of it. That's right. So let's not just discount what is happening right now in our world and, and just say, well, man, look what the devil's doing. He's just tearing everything up. No, 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 no. I believe the church and even our world, we are at a, at a moment in time where God is going to do something amazing if we will let him, if we will press in, and is if we will be the people of God. So uh, I'm just going to read one verse today, and it's out of uh, John. So if you have a Bible, you can go to John, and I'm only read one verse, but it's John chapter 1, and it's verse 14. If you're brand new to church, I, I was just talking to a lady this week. She's brand new to our church. She's only been like three times. I've been watching a little bit online. She doesn't have a Bible, and I was telling her today about Version. And if you don't know about Version, it's a Bible app. And she's, she's never been to church. She doesn't know anything about Jesus. And so I was talking to her about this Bible app called Version. And the version of the Bible that I'm going to be reading out of is called the New Living Translation. Because she told me, and maybe this is your experience with the Bible, she goes, I don't read it because I don't understand what it says. And I, and I said, well, that's because you're probably reading the old school Shakespearean language. And <laughs> no one understands that anymore. But So the New Living Translation is what I'm reading out of. I think it's a great version for you if you really want to begin to understand Scripture. So here's John, and John was one of Jesus' disciples. And he was many think he was Jesus' best friend. And so in the book of John, he just simply wrote the stories about Jesus. And, and in chapter 1, he talks about the coming of Jesus, the coming of the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And I just want to read to you one verse, and it's verse 14. John says it this way, So the word and it's a capital W, the Word, and that means Jesus. Jesus became human, and He made His home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Let's pray. Father, as we have this time together right now in homes all across the area, in in apartments, in uh, some people out in their backyards, as families, on, on Zoom, all the different ways. Would you right now, God, would you just in this moment do what only you can do? Would you collectively bring us together? We want to hear from you today, and would you help us in Jesus' name? And everybody in the room said, Amen. 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 All right, I cannot wait until we are in a large room and we all get to say that uh, together. So the, the title of my the, our series right now is called Welcome to the Neighborhood, but the title of my message today, are you ready for this, is 
Won't you be my neighbor? Come on. I know when you hear that, we're all thinking the same thing. So if they would please cue the music. Yes, I have done it. I brought the sweater. It's a beautiful day for the neighborhood. It's a beautiful day for the neighbor. Would you, Mr. Rogers does this so much easier than I do. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Come on, everybody. Won't you be my neighbor? I even brought shoes for it. Yes, I did. So glad that you joined us for, for church today. It's gonna be a beautiful day as we talk about the Lord. And know what you're all thinking right now. Is he gonna preach like this the entire time? Is this how he's gonna talk the whole time? No, just till I can get my shoes on. How does he do this so quickly? I don't know if you've seen the, oh, I did it. I did the, uh, did you see that? The, huh? How many of you guys watch Mr. Rogers? Raise your hand, Mr. Rogers. Okay, some of you? Yeah, uh, okay. Um, I, Pastor Eric and I, who you uh, heard earlier leading worship, he watched Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. How many of you in the room and at home, raise your hands. How many uh, did not watch the show? Like, okay, and I'm with you, Gina. I, uh, I, I never, I couldn't watch it. It was too slow for me, way too slow. And um, you know, although Mr. Rogers is a lot like me, he's very soft-spoken. And so, uh, no, he's nothing like me. And I, it was just so, I just could not get into it. So I always had to turn over and watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or something great like He-Man or something like that. And I'm not wearing this sweater the entire time. I just can't, I can't, I, I can't do it. I'm staying with the shoes, but I know the sweater will be, will be distracting to you. But I, how many of you have seen the, um, the movie with Tom Hanks? Anybody in the room, you've seen the Tom Hanks movie? Welcome to the... Oh my gosh, you guys, you have got to see this movie. It is so, so good. Have you seen the documentary? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the, the one thing when you see the movie is if you rent it is the story of Mr. Rogers and the interaction he had with this reporter. The documentary is phenomenal because what you realize when you watch it is this guy was really like this. Like this was not something he put on, some act for television, but... He really was like that. I mean, everywhere he went, whoever he was around, they were always the most important person in the room. And when Mr. Rogers said, welcome to the neighborhood, like, he meant it. And, and I believe that Jesus has given us kind of the same command. We, we talk about this a lot, is, is Jesus, when he, we talked about this last week with the Good Samaritan, is a religious, uh, uh, an expert in religious law came to Jesus and said, what's the most important commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And then he said this, and he, a second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. So Mr. Rogers and Jesus have a lot in common. I mean, they, it's about loving your neighbor. It's something we say every week. We say this, at the core of who we are is loving God and loving people. That, that's what it is all about. But could we, we all know right now in our country, we're just not experiencing that. Uh, and, and the word that comes to my mind when I think about what's happening right now in our country is, is chaos. It's just crazy what's happening between COVID-19 and the racial unrest and then Right here, I, I don't know where you're watching from, but we're here in the Tulsa metro area and Broken Arrow, and, and right here, I mean, we've had the collision uh, of, um, of a rally and protesting and the president, and, and just talk about div divisiveness and, and all of the injustice that's happening and the anger and, and all that is happening around us. And you, you just, when you, when you hear what's going on, it seems like this is the worst possible moment for the church to not be meeting together on Sundays. It seems like this is the worst time. This is the worst possible thing that could happen for us. But I actually believe the opposite. I know it may sound crazy, but I really believe that God has intentionally shut the doors of the building on Sunday. And he has intentionally opened up the doors in our neighborhoods. He's opened up our homes. Like right now, we, many of us right now are meeting in homes all over the metro area. We've all for the last few months have been locked down in our homes, haven't we? I mean, you've been doing school in your home. You've been working from your home. You've been shopping from home. And we have been doing church like we are right now in our home. 
And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down because I think this is what we want to talk about for a, a few minutes here is the, the, the church has not been shut down. We've been sent out. Let me say that again. The church has not been shut down. The church has actually been sent out. That's what I believe right now is happening. In fact, if you've been coming to Core Church for any amount of time, you know that we are a sending church. It's one of our favorite things to do. Whether we send people to other states, we send people to other cities, or we send people right out into our own city to, to launch ministries. We have people that are doing ministries around the world. We are all about you figuring out who God created you to be so that we can all be collectively sent back out into the world. Because I think what God wants to do is through you and through me, he wants to send us out into our neighborhoods. I believe God is wanting us in our neighborhoods because he's wanting to wake us up to our neighbors so we can see them. He wants to send us back out into the neighborhoods with the hope and the healing and the peace and the purpose of Jesus. Yeah. So the question is, how do I do that? Like, um, I, like you may be saying, hey, that that's, might be easy for you to say, because, but I've not been to seminary. I've not had the training. I don't even know my neighbor's name. Um, I fumble with my words. I, I couldn't even find John when you were talking about this. So how would I even begin to do this? I, I want to present to you today that I think it's a lot easier than we made it out to be. I think we've made sharing the gospel way too complicated. And I also think that we have kind of misconstrued sometimes what sharing the gospel really is. And so what I want to do today is show you just a simple way an easy and effective way that you can share the gospel. But I also want us to see why it's important to share the gospel. And I also want us to see how, like how, how I can do that. And I think what we're going to show you today is a way that maybe you've just never thought about it, that, wait, that's sharing the gospel? So we'll look at, at Jesus from John's perspective. John chapter 1, verse 14 says this, so the word, and that's capital W, that's Jesus, so Jesus he became what? He became human. This is, this, is, this is important. Like, we just can't gloss over this. Jesus became human. Why did John point this out? I think the reason G John pointed this out is that he's saying to us this. Jesus became human. And we all know that Jesus became human for the salvation of the world. Like, he came to die for the sins of humanity so that we could be set free. But I also believe Jesus became human to show us how to be human. I think we've forgotten how to be human. It, if you go all the way back to the very beginning, in, in Genesis chapter 1, it tells us in Genesis chapter 1, right there at the beginning, we were created in the image of God. All of us created in the image of God. But what happened is that image has been tarnished by sin. And, and what we see as a result of that today is all of the injustice, the, the bigotry, the hatred, the anger, the depression, the suicide, loneliness, abuse, addiction, all, all of that is what? It is a result of the fall. It's a result of the tarnished sin image, the tarnished image of, of mankind. And, and what we see today is, man, the world is many times anything but human. I mean, right now, we're acting so inhumane. Right now, we see the, that we are dehumanizing people. We're, we're categorizing people. And I won't associate with those people. I won't, I won't be around them. Oh, oh, you vote, you're going to vote for that person. Oh, this is how you feel about that issue. And then suddenly, we just dehumanize one another, we put them into category, and then we forget what it is to be human. I think we've just forgotten what it means to be human. So we look at Jesus, and Jesus became fully human to simply show us how to be image bearers of God. That's why he became human, to show us how to be image bearers of God. You and I are image bearers of God. Like Jesus came to walk among us. To, the reason he came to walk among us is to show us the image of God, like to show us that, oh, oh God is love. God is for justice. God is kind. God is grace. And you and I are the image bearers of that. The Apostle Paul, who um, is the author of most of the New Testament, he founded a church, and, uh, and it's the book of Colossians where he wrote to that church that he founded. And in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, he said, he said it this way, put on your new nature. In other words, put on the image of God. 
Put, put on grace, put on mercy, put on forgiveness, uh, put on justice, and be renewed as you learn to know your creator. As you begin to think about it, as you begin to know your creator, in other words, how you were created, as you begin to know how you were created in the image of God, and he says it this way about becoming the, it, like the image of God. He says, and this, say this with me, the last part, become like him. That's what it's all about as a follower of Jesus. It's just about becoming like Christ. So Paul says, Paul says, you and I are the image bearers of God to the world. We're the image bearers of grace. We're the image bearers of justice. We're the image bearers of forgiveness and reconciliation. And we are the image bearers, as we talked about last week, of, of unity. As followers of Jesus, created over in the image of God, we have the answer. Like, we have the answer for the injustice. We have the answer for the division. We have the answer for loneliness. We have the answer for depression. We have the answer for addiction. We have the answer for uh, abuse. It, 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 we have the answer that the world is looking for. And Paul again addresses this. And this time, instead of talking to the church he founded the Col in Colossians, he, he talks about the church that he founded in Corinth. So he wrote this letter to the church in Corinth. And it's in 2 Corinthians 5.20. And Paul said it, this to them. God is making his appeal through us. Like, turn to somebody in the room, wherever you are, and say, that means you. Like, that means you. He's, he's talking about the appeal, the appeal to be human, the appeal to be made over in the image of God. It comes from us. And this is what I want us to see as we talk about this idea of welcome to the neighborhood. God has strategically placed you in your neighborhood. He strategically placed you in your workplace. He strategically placed you in your school on that campus. He strategically placed you and your kids on that ball team on purpose for a purpose. He has something he's wanting to do through you. Remember this, the church, the church has not been shut down. The church has been sent out. So back in John's letter, John chapter one, verse 14 says this, so the word became human, and, and say this part with me, he made his home among us. He made his home among us. I like what Eugene Peterson said in the message translation. It's one of my favorites. It says he moved into the neighborhood. I love that. He moved in the neighborhood. I get this picture when the way Eugene Peterson wrote it is that like Jesus like downloaded the Zillow app. <laughs> And he's like searching floor plans, you know, and he's thinking, you know, I kind of want to move out of the crowded city. I want something away, a little, little more quiet, maybe something down near Galilee, maybe maybe overlooking the sea. And I just see him like looking at homes and seeing one that's like a fixer upper. He's like, well, I am a carpenter. I am a son of God. I can handle this because I mean, he just put new cabinets in. That's he just can do that. I can just see him going to the, you know, going to the house. He's got Peter, James, and John with him, and they're looking it over. And he's like, you know, and he's not worried about the school district because you know he's not going to have any kids. <laughs> so, but it's, I just see him like looking at you know. I, I just see Jesus with Peter, James, and John going. Okay, so what I envision is I'm going to build a deck right here overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Isn't that honestly what we all do when we pick the neighborhood we move into? I do. Can can I just tell you like the last three months? Uh, I've been telling you about Aunt Mary has been staying with us, and uh, I got great news. Aunt Mary is going to be moving in with us permanently. Can I get an amen? Can I get a witness in the room? This is good news. I can tell you how, why this is good news to me. She came around the corner, and I was taking the shirts off uh, the, by the dryer and was going to take them up to my room, and she looked at me, and she said, Brad, would you like me to iron those for you? You can live here permanently. <laughs> you can stay. And so because we're looking at Aunt Mary moving in, Laura's mom is, is with us. I'm like, I'm looking at our floor plan and we don't have the room. And I'm like, oh, we've got to find a new place to live. And we've got to, we got to expand or do something. And I've, so I've been on Zillow. I've been looking at floor plans. I've been looking at square footage. I've been looking at where rooms are. I've been, been looking at neighborhoods. I, in fact, actually, I was at a member of our church a couple of weeks ago and they live about a mile from me. Uh, right off of Elm, and I pulled off, and they live back in this quiet neighborhood, and they, and they got like 
a lot of space between the neighbors. I mean, just a lot of land and it's really super quiet, beautiful trees. And I said, if a home in your neighborhood comes up for sale and I want to buy it. I mean, that's what we do when we move into a neighborhood. But that's not what Jesus did. That's not what Jesus did at all. Jesus, actually, Jesus was very intentional. Jesus was on mission. Like he picked the place in in time. He picked the place he was going to live on purpose. Like he picked Galilee over Jerusalem. It's interesting. He picked He picked the valley over the mountain. Laura and I have been to Jerusalem. Jerusalem kind of sits up high, and Galilee is down in the valley. And and Jesus chose not to be on the mountain, but he chose to go down into the valley. I I think it's fascinating that Jesus, Son of God, he, he you would think, Son of God, why wouldn't you purchase a home or live in a home that's close to the the place of religious activity like Jerusalem? But he says, No, I actually, I, I actually want to be away from the religious activity. I actually am going to live in the valley. I think God is calling all of us to the valley. I think he's calling all of us to live in the valley. I think he's calling us all to places that are really far from the religious activity. I think somewhat of what we're doing right now is a shaking that God is doing in the church right now. Because let's just be honest. If you're like me, we like to live mountaintop to mountaintop. We want to live on the mountaintop, and we want to live from Sunday to Sunday. And I get that because, man, when we gather on Sundays and when we gather again, there is an energy in the room, the Spirit of God in the room. I mean, it is powerful from the worship to our preaching. If you've never heard our preaching, our pastor is off the chain, okay? Way better than in a living room, okay? But... (laughs) I can't wait till there's a lot of people. I love preaching to a lot of people. But when you're, we're there, man, it is like a mountaintop experience. But if we're not careful, we can live mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop. And I wonder, I just wonder if maybe we have been guilty of doing that. And I wonder, and I might, I'm okay if I'm wrong, but I wonder if God just said enough. I'm going to shut down the mountaintop. You're not going to be able to go to the mountaintop. Because I want you to go into the valley. I want you to go into the brokenness. So often we get in our cars and we drive right by the people in our neighborhood that need Jesus more than anything. We don't think about them. We don't, we don't, look, we don't give them a second thought. We just drive to the church and we drive to the mountaintop and then we drive back. And, then we, and I believe God is calling us down off the mountaintop into the the valley. So what I wonder is what if we what if we rethought our neighborhoods? Like what if we rethought our workplaces? Like why do I work there? Is it really to get a promotion and make money and and be successful? I would say yeah. I think that's that's a, those are all really good reasons. There's nothing wrong with making money. I, I man, more power to you, but could there be more to the reason why God has you there? Be a reason why maybe he has you on that campus? Could it be a reason maybe why he has you on that ball team more than just so you can be on a traveling team and hopefully that this will happen for your child and they can do this and they can meet this person, this can happen, they can get on, on the next team and then finally hopefully make it get, get a scholarship and go to college. Okay, great. But could it be more than that? Could it be that God has intentionally placed you where you are at for a mission? What, what if we rethought this? What if we lived our lives on mission? I was really challenged by this when we were thinking about moving, and I was looking on Zillow, and Laura and I, I'll never forget, uh, early on in COVID, and we were walking, like everybody else, just <laughs> you know, walking the neighborhood, seeing the neighbors and walking, and I remember, so I remember right where I was at. We were at the end of the block, we were turning the corner, and we were coming back up the block, and we were talking about moving, and we were talking about where, could, where should we go, what would be good neighborhoods, what would be good homes, and all of a sudden, I looked up. And I, and I saw my neighbor's homes. And I don't know how, it wasn't an audible voice, but I can tell you God spoke to me deep in my spirit. And he said, Brad, I don't want you to just think of a home and living in a home, but I want you to think that, I, that you are a missionary. You're a missionary to this neighborhood. 
I have you here on purpose. This is your mission field. And you need to find out if I'm calling you to a new mission field. I've never thought about my neighborhood that way. Like, I've, I've always prayed for my neighbors. I've always reached out to my neighbors. But I never thought about it being a calling. Like, I'm actually called. I'm placed right there. And Laura and I, it just caused us pause. And I said, um, and I started looking at my neighbors, and I says like, Glenn and Cheryl and Jeannie and, uh, and Jeannie, who comes to Court Church now, and uh, Patty, my next-door neighbor, is a single mom. And I, and I think about Delano and Joey, my brand-new neighbors, and Nathan and Heather and Max and Riley, who now come to Court Church. And, and I thought, I, I, and, and Mike and Aaron next door, and on and on and on, these neighbors that we know. And I thought, I, I don't know that God has released us. I think even if our home is too small, I think we may have to stay. Because I, I think maybe God has called us here. Here's what I, I would like for you to write down, it's like for you, you to consider, is this. I am a missionary. I am a missionary. Say that with me, come on. I am a missionary. I'm a missionary. Write this down. On mission. I am a missionary on mission. Assigned to a mission field. What if we live that way? What if we lived as missionaries on mission, assigned to a mission field? Here's what I believe. I believe that missionaries aren't just sent across the sea. I believe that missionaries are also sent across the street. I believe that God is calling us to go across the street. This is, this is what, God's not asking us to do anything that, that he did not do. Jesus left heaven and he was sent like he was on mission, he was, he was a missionary, and he crossed the street. In other words, he, as Eugene Peterson says, he moved into the neighborhood. I mean, he, he joined us here, and I believe God is calling us to cross the street. I believe he's calling us to love our neighbors as ourselves. And I, I think when we think about these last three months, I think there's a reason why we've been locked down in our neighborhoods. I think God's trying to get our attention to say, do you know your neighbors? Like, do you know them by name? Do you know their story? Like, do, do you sense that God has placed you here to reach them, to, to, to encourage them, to, to bring them the hope and the healing and the peace and the purpose of, of Jesus? I was talking to a really good friend of mine who doesn't live here in, in Tulsa, and he was telling me that him and his wife, uh, during all of the pandemic, started placing their chairs in the front yard. They'd always sat in the backyard, and they decided, we're going to start sitting in the front yard. And he said, Brad, the first time we started getting to know our neighbors... He said, the funniest thing is my neighbor across the street, guy had lived, has lived there for 10 years. I did not know him. 10 years. Didn't know his name. Don't know anything about him. His neighbor walks across the street, meets him, and come to find out the guy's a pastor. What? What's happened to us? What, what's happened when even the pastor, as a pastor, if, uh, you don't know your name. How do you, God is calling us to be on mission. He's, he's calling us to reach our neighbors. And so often we know our neighbors as, oh yeah, they're the ones whose dog won't shut up and quit barking. <laughs> they're, oh yeah, that's my neighbor who cranks the loud music at 1130 at night. I am about to call the cops on him. That's my neighbor who always parks in front of my mailbox. You know, the, oh, there's my neighbor who doesn't edge their yard. I, mean, <laughs> I just listed off some of my neighbors. None of the names I listed earlier, by the way, just for, just for the record. They all are good people. But often that's how we know our neighbors. And I, I think we got to learn how to neighbor again. I think we can learn from Mr. Rogers. Like the one thing he did, if you've not watched his documentary, you've got to watch the documentary because the thing about Mr. Rogers, you wonder why. He always stopped for people. He always seemed to have time for people. And he genuinely loved people. And whoever that person was that he was in front of, he said was the most important person in the world. And, and the reason he did, and you may know this, you may not know this, is Mr. Rogers was an ordained pastor. He was an ordained preacher. He was a follower of Jesus. The reason he did what he did is he was just trying to model the life of Jesus because that's what Jesus did. Jesus always slowed down. So often, I'm in a big hurry. I'm tired. I get out of my truck, and I see my neighbors, and I do this. And I hope that they just kind of do that back. <laughs> 
If they don't, I might just have to walk across the street. But what if we rethought that? What if we thought that, man, God has placed me intentionally where I'm at and I was to walk across the street and get to know them, their name and their story? So what does that look like? How do we do that? Let's go back to John 1.14. It says this, He, being Jesus, was full of, and say this with me, is full of what? Unfailing love and faithfulness. This is who Jesus is. If, if you're brand new and you, you're just getting online with us and you're like that uh, beautiful lady that I spoke to earlier this week and you're like, I don't have a clue who Jesus is. Like, I don't know anything about church. I don't know anything about this Jesus. This is who Jesus is. I don't know what story you've heard about him, but this is who he is. He is full of unfailing love and faith. This is why he came. This is what our world desperately needs right now. I mean, just the weekend we're having in Tulsa, like, can, like suddenly, I, I never thought that Tulsa would become the center of the universe. Like we have the, it's kind of funny, we have the center of the universe in downtown Tulsa. We have become the center of the universe. I never would have, and I would have never thought it would be such polarizing things. And I don't know where you land on that. And right now, I don't really care about that right now. I care about those things. But if you understand what I mean by that, but we have become the center. And what it is right now, we in the church have this opportunity to show the love and faithfulness of Jesus to a world that so desperately needs it. And what did Jesus do? Jesus moved into a rough neighborhood. Let's not forget that. Wait, wait, what? Jesus moved into a broken world. Like the world was broken. Things were messed up. And he decided, I'm going to move into that. And in the midst of the mess and the oppression and the injustice and the bigotry and the hatred and the rejection and the belittling of, of, of women and others, Jesus moved into the middle of that. And what did he do? He didn't, he didn't, get angry. He didn't get violent. He didn't reject people. He didn't push them away. No, he just loved people. Unfailing love and faithfulness. See, Jesus was fully God and he was fully human. And God does not expect us to be fully God. He just expects us to be fully human, filled with the spirit of God. He's asking us to be image bearers. He's asking us to be human, to show the world what it really means to be human, to what it means to be created in the image of God. We are his image bearers. We are the ones who are to show unfailing love and faithfulness. So, so how do we do that? How, I mean, I realize for so many of you, and I've talked to a lot of you, you're like, Brad, I mean, I don't even know my neighbor's name. You're not alone in that. And this, by the way, is not a guilt trip. This isn't, this isn't about, oh, you're just a horrible person because you don't know your neighbors. You're a horrible person because you don't think about your... That, that's not what this is about. This is about us, though, opening up our eyes that the blind could see that I could say today, oh, okay, I, I get it. I, you know what? H how do I do this? I'm going to give you three words. Core Church, you're familiar with these three words, but I find this is the simplest and easiest way to share the gospel, and I believe this is what the gospel is. Intercede, invest, inform. Those are the three things you need to do. Intercede, invest, inform. I can tell you about 20 years ago, I, I was so overwhelmed and not sharing the gospel. I was, all I dealt with was guilt and shame and condemnation in my life. I wanted desperately for people to know Jesus, but I just felt like, okay, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get the gospel. I gotta say the right scripture. I gotta have the right uh, speech memorized. And then, and, then, and then I gotta close the deal. I gotta get him to say the prayer. That, there, I don't know where you're gonna find that in scripture. Like, I don't know where you find that plan in there. The, the plan I find is, is this, intercede, invest, and inform. This is what Jesus, listen, you pray. This, I, I, this is something that I've just practiced the last few years, and, and, and the people at Core Church have practiced, and I think it's so, so good. Just start praying. Intercede, pray for your neighbors, pray for them by name. All my neighbors that I mentioned, uh, they're in my phone. I pray for them every day. Uh, they don't know that, but they know it now because <laughs> I know some of them are watching uh, right now. I, I know that uh, Aaron and Sue Ellen, who, hey guys, I want you to know, I pray for you. Um, I pray for you every day because I care about you because I want good for my neighbors. 
I want them to have the joy and the peace and the love that I've experienced with Jesus. That's why I pray for them. I just want so much good for them and, and, uh, and their two kids. I just want them to have that in their life. So begin praying for them. If you don't know them by name, pray that God will give you an opportunity. Pray for the courage. To, you know what I, I would encourage you to do is this. Be awkward. Don't be weird. Be awkward. Walk across the street, go next door, knock on the door and say, hey, my bad. I've lived here for five years. I've lived here for 10 years. I've lived here for how many? I can't believe I don't know your name. This is embarrassing. What's your name? That may seem weird, but you know what your neighbor is going to say? I probably should have asked you the same thing. Uh, I just know your last name because I get your mail every once in a while. That's the only way I know your name. But, may, but just begin praying for opportunities and then invest. This is where I think we miss it. Just do good. Be human. Be image bearers of God. Like be, Let me tell you practically what I've done. I have, I have edged and mowed my neighbor Patty's yard for like 17 years. You know why I've done that? Because she has three kids, she's a single mom. She didn't have time to do that. She's working hard. I watch her come home. She's exhausted. She's tired. I'm like, it's like a four foot strip on my yard. And you, you know the yard, you know what I'm talking about, where you have your grass, they have their grass, nobody knows where to mow. And I said, you know, I'm just going to do that. And I just mow, and then I just edge your driveway. It takes me like 20 minutes. Why do I do that? Because I just want to do good. I just want to help her. I mean, I remember when Delano and Joey moved in and, and they backed their truck up and I was tired and I was like, you know what? God said, go help them move in. And so you know what I did? I went over and I just said, okay, helped them unload the truck at like 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, 9.30, way past my bedtime. All you all know that. So I, but I helped them unload the truck and it was amazing because then we stood there in, in their, um, in their garage. And, and then I, I began to share with them the scriptures and I began to share with them the gospel. And, and then they said, man, how can we have Jesus in our life? And we knelt there right there in their garage and they accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I baptized them in their bathroom. No, none of that happened. Like none of that happened. You're missing the point. Like the point was just to invest, just to do good. Why? Because I'm really excited to have them in my neighbor. I'm super stoked about them being my neighbors, and I want to be a great neighbor, and I want them to know you're created in the image of God. I want you to know God has purposes and plans for your life, and I just want to help you any way that I can. And then the final thing on that is to inform. When, when God presents the opportunity, inform them of the hope and the healing, the peace, and the purpose that you found in Jesus. Just wait for that moment. When will that be, Brad? I can't tell you. I just know that if you pray and you do good, God suddenly in that moment will speak to you and you go, this is the moment. This is, this is the time. We are the image bearers. I, I truly believe that, that God has intentionally shut the doors of our building because he's wanting us to open up the doors of our home. We be an image bearer of God. So we're going to take communion together, and um, Laura's going to help. We're going to hand that out in the room, and we're going to receive communion together. And you can, in, in your own homes, you can get the, um, the sacraments together that you, that you have, and um, however, however you're doing that today. But as we move into communion, here's what I want you to think about. Um, this time and this moment is a time for us to reflect and is to think, man, God, what is it you're speaking into my life? What is it you want me to do in my life? Man, maybe today you say, man, I don't have the courage. I just don't have the boldness. Maybe today you need to come to the table, figuratively come to the table and receive courage and boldness from Jesus to step out and love your neighbor as yourself. Or maybe, maybe you don't know Jesus. You're, you're like the, the lady that I met earlier this week, and you're like, I, I don't even know who Jesus is, and this is what I want you to know. Man, he came for you. Man, all, all, whatever you're experiencing in your life today, loneliness or, or hurt or disappointment or brokenness or maybe injustice in your own life, maybe you, you suffered abuse. I don't know what it is, but God says, I want to heal you. Salvation is for you, and salvation is, is full and complete. He says, man, you just come today, you receive Jesus, you receive the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of Jesus. What Jesus wants to do today is make you back into his image to be fully human again, fully alive in Christ. 
So if you're new to our gathering, communion and new to communion, it's just this time where we remember the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It's where we receive what it is we need from him today. The, the cup, it represents the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of sin. If you need forgiveness today, for anything today, whatever it is, you receive forgiveness today. The, the bread, it represents the body of Christ. Died a human death, but resurrected again on the third day, which means it doesn't matter what happens in your life, doesn't matter how hard it gets, there's always hope of a resurrection. What is it you need from him today? I'm gonna pray and then we're going to receive. Father, right now in this moment, would you bring forgiveness where forgiveness is needed? Would you help those today who say, man, I just don't know. Would God really forgive me? What I want you to know today is, he says, yes, yes. I, I wanna pour out my grace and my mercy on you. And if you need boldness today, just ask God for boldness and receive that today. Let Christ fill you. Allow yourself to become an image bearer of God, made over to be like Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Let's receive. Well, I want to thank you for joining us online. I especially want to thank the Darnells for opening up their home and letting us come in here and sit in their living room. This has been really special. They've been really good friends for a long, long time. I love their family a lot, and it's really cool to see them uh, just sit in their living room and do this with them. And But I just want to, whatever happened today for you, whatever Jesus did in your life, would you share that with us? Just go to corechurch.com. Uh, Laura and I and our staff, we would love to connect with you. We'd love to help you. Um, if you made a commitment to follow Jesus, let us know about that. Maybe you need prayer. Maybe you're going through a really brutal time. Don't go through it alone. Don't go through that alone. And go to corechurch.com. You can, you can submit a prayer request right there. We really want to partner with you. We really want to come alongside you and help you and encourage you any way that we can. I want to encourage you, if you're not in a, in a neighborhood gathering, get in one. Uh, but maybe if you're not ready, get, in, get into uh, one of our, our Zoom groups right now and, and do church on Zoom. However you want to do that, all that, you can sign up at, at corechurch.com. And we're going to say our sending prayer together. I think this, this prayer is so perfect for the series that we're in. So um, let's, let's say this prayer together. God, fill me with love and give me boldness to share the hope, healing, peace, and purpose that I've found in Jesus. Lead me to the hurting, the hopeless, the lonely, and the discouraged. This week, I declare that I'm available and willing to be used for your glory and honor. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. You're going to see some questions come up at the end. I encourage you in your neighborhood gatherings or on Zoom or or if you're just with your family today, or even if you're alone, just you, to take these questions, contemplate them, talk about them together. God bless you, and we'll see you next week here online.